lifers. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the 1010 podcast. You know the drill. We're talking about life, all things pertaining to the abundant life that we have through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm super excited for today's episode, and I know you're going to love it. I'm calling it Life 360. I have some fabulous guests with me. I will introduce them in just a minute. But thank you again for tuning in. I know that God has something awesome for you. Let's get started. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining me at my kitchen table. Actually, our kitchen table. Hey, bring it on. Because this is our house. This is my husband, Jay. Um, but I want to take a minute and just introduce each of you for our audience, and then we're going to take some time to hear a little bit more from you. But right here, I have my good friend, Jared Bur Burns. So say hello to Jared, everyone. Hi, Jared. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and his official title, Washington State Catalyst for Love Life. That's Thank right. Thank you so much for joining us. And right next to you is your beautiful wife, my friend, <laughs> Beth Burns. And she is the executive director of Abundant Life, not to be confused with love life, although they're connected. Yeah, we like to make it confusing for people. It's exciting. <laughs> yes, and we're going to hear more about both of those ministries in just a second. Next, I have the beautiful Marlene Shirley, <laughs> and she actually works at Cedar Park Church with us. She's my husband's um, executive assistant and our office manager. So thank you so much for joining us yeah. today. And um, also, I can't forget your husband, Jason, yes. who um, Jason and Marlene were our youth pastors mm -hmm. growing up. So we're sorry right. <laughs> for everything. No, so good job. Yeah, good job, I mean. <laughs> no, we love Jason and Marlene. And um, aside from their jobs, they do amazing work at the church. And so I'm excited for everyone to hear more about that in just a moment. And next to her is Josh Sperry. Josh, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah. And you work for Olive Crest. I do. And your role is the church engagement director. For the PNW. PNW. <laughs> Woohoo. Yeah. We're so excited to hear from you, thank you. Excited and to be here. the story of you and your wife, Lacey. Um, thank you so much for being here. And next to me, my favorite of all, of course, <laughs> is <laughs> all of our favorites, um, Jay, who is the senior pastor. I love saying senior pastor. I'm very senior. That's the way we do it at Cedar Park. You know, a lot of churches say lead pastor, but it's Cedar Park. Why do we call different? it it's senior, well, pastor. senior pastor? I'm getting more senior every year. So, so when I like tell people the that, role. they'll look at me like, yeah. oh, here's the senior. I'm like, yeah, the senior, like not of just the seniors, but <laughs> the most senior pastor <laughs> of Cedar Park Church. And also, more importantly, my husband. Most importantly. Most importantly <laughs> of all that. So I'm excited just to have a conversation with you guys and true to form. We didn't rehearse this, you know, so we're just going to be just like we're having breakfast together here. Um, the things that we would talk about, the things that the Lord is doing in our in our personal lives, in our ministries. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's all just take a deep breath. <laughs> <sighs> and let the conversation begin. So yes. I, I'll just start right here with you, Jared. I would love for you just to introduce yourself again, like you can tell us about your family and what you do, and also a little bit about why you do what you do. Yeah, well, happy to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, we might have to jump back and forth because our story is combined, yes. but I grew up in a Christian home, good Christian home church near here, and uh, always a solid understanding of life that mm -hmm. was taught from that church. So good understanding growing up about what that meant. And uh, got into ministry at a church out in the valley, not too far from here, for about nine years, leading worship mm -hmm. and working with youth and adult yeah. musicians. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but the youth were more fun to work with. <laughs> uh, out. The youth musicians, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but we had wonderful people, and that's actually uh, where my wife and I met at that church and got to do ministry alongside each other, and now we got three kids, one entering high school and mm -hmm. an 11-year-old boy, and oldest is a daughter, 11-year-old boy and a girl that's five years old, about to turn 15, uh, uh, turning five years <laughs> old next way. month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, just like that. She'll be 15. Yeah, just a few weeks ago. Yeah, she, she is the one that's five years old going on 15. 
15 for sure. <laughs> we say sometimes she's more trouble than both the others combined, <laughs> but we love them. But yeah, um, I really never really, you know, I knew what I believed, didn't know what my place was. I think that's all, honestly a common thing for men, uh, you know, initially is what can we say? Where do we fit into this whole fight? And I think that's where I need to pass it off to Beth because she's really, she got involved with her ministry, uh, started finding a direction. And then uh, through that, I learned that one of the pieces that was mi missing in this battle is the church. And mm. we can come back to that. Yeah, we had conversations really early on doing ministry side by side. Uh, obviously, that drew us together before marriage, but just knowing uh, that it was really important to us that we married somebody that had a solid pro-life stance um, mm -hmm. that was going to be really important to us. We didn't really see why, but I think God yeah. obviously, you know, mm. our, our families built that into us, but God had a purpose that we didn't expect. So worship ministry um, did not end up being our full-time thing like we had expected for so many years. And uh, that really led me particularly to a place of sort of a crisis, mm. um, not knowing who I was anymore. I was going to be a worship pastor's wife. We were going to lead worship. We were going to go to a, a worship school. And so who are we now? Mm. And um, and I think that that may be common for some people, especially when I was driving my idea of how I was going to serve the Lord. It was about me and how I felt I was mm. gifted or trained and wanted to serve the Lord. And I love worship. I, I grieve some days that that's not mm. part of what we do, although God's always given us opportunities. So he really just brought us uh, through a series of circumstances to a, a place where I was so broken. I said, okay, Lord, I just want to serve you. I don't mm. have an idea of what that looks like. Just please use me. I just mm. want to be used, which is probably what he's waiting for every yeah. single one of us to do, <laughs> you know, to yeah. set aside our own dreams and hopes and desires and focus solely on what he's mm -hmm. doing. Mm. It reminded me of Psalm 51 this morning. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And there's beauty in that brokenness mm. when we surrender yeah. it to him. And then he builds something that we could have never imagined. Yeah. So do you want me to keep going about abundant life, how it started and how that led to it? Or? Yeah, you might do that because uh, that kind of leads yeah, into come Jared's. back into it later. Cool. Yeah. I mean, so uh, after sort of just starting real small, like as a, a mom of two young kids, it was, you know, what are some behind the scenes way that I can serve that's different that I haven't done before? So I won't go into what that looked like. But eventually that led to sidewalk outreach ministry mm -hmm. in Everett, mm -hmm. which was definitely outside of my comfort zone. Uh, and God was good to bring me to a mentor and somebody that could train me in that because it does take good training to go out and, uh, and engage people well, especially on the topic of abortion. But uh, pretty quickly after getting started, I had my first interaction with an abortion bound mom. And I was standing on the sidewalk in the morning at the Everett Planned Parenthood on a rainy day with an umbrella. And this girl turned the corner and started walking up the sidewalk towards me. She was wearing a, a sweatshirt that said sinful across the chest. And I'm like, wow. oh, Lord Jesus, what? <laughs> like, what is it? If she get, turns into that driveway, I don't know what to say. I really just went yeah. out there to pray initially. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to engage people. Mm -hmm. And so I just had a quick prayer sent up like, Lord, if you want me to talk to her, you're going to have to send her to me because I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to call out to her and speak to her. And so, you know, as, as Lord would have it, she uh, veered out of the driveway and headed straight for me. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Some prayers are like, please don't answer this, Lord. But mm -hmm. he did. And uh, so what ensued was, you know, she asked to use my phone and I asked her just a few questions. And we had a 45 minute conversation mm. about her history of wow. abandonment and abuse. And she had just actually gotten out of prison and was pregnant and coming to have an abortion. At the end of our 45 minute conversation, she wrote the information for our local pregnancy clinic on the back of her abortion consent forms. And my mind was wow. just just mm. blown like. So these people will just talk to you and you can share about Jesus. I mean, it's basic evangelism. Obviously, I hadn't had yeah. a lot of experience there. Um, so that led to working with uh, a ministry, Living Hope, and, and David Graves, who's been my mentor for many years now. And so he would... He would usually be the one that was intercepting the moms. That was his main ministry. And then we would work together to try and figure out well, where do we where do we send these women mm. for the actual help? You know, the pregnancy resource clinics do a lot, but they don't do all of the things that a woman is going to need. That's usually in layers of difficulty. So mm -hmm. seven years ago, we set out to bring together the gospel centered pro-life ministries in Washington state, bring them to the table once a month so that they can build relationship and kind of break down any walls that might be there. Mm -hmm. And really the Lord does the work there. He's he's a unifier. We're unified mm -hmm. through his spirit. And so we work with with Christians who are doing this work um, for life. So that led to basically six branches of what we call the pro-life ecosystem, which is, you know, kind of identifying the housing programs, the pregnancy clinics, adoption services, transportation, mm. support groups, and other medical support. So other medical ministries, those are sort of the main areas we see women struggling. And they mm. may say, well, if I just had this, 
then maybe I wouldn't consider abortion. Yeah. So we really want to be the hands and feet of Jesus in meeting those tangible needs. Yeah. Um, and that's what that's what we're doing. So uh, Jared was there from day one. I basically was like, hey, so I want to go out on the sidewalk <laughs> in Everett and try and reach out to these moms. And he's so chill. Like, he's just a really <laughs> mellow guy. And he's just like, okay, well, show me on a map where in Everett this is. I want to have an idea of where you're launching yourself with these two little kids. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I guess that area is probably not too bad. Did you bring your kids with you? No, not then. I okay. have since then, but just in the beginning, I had to kind of get the lay of the land, get some training first. And I do now. My 14-year-old's actually really well trained and was just out there last Saturday with me wow. in Seattle Stunning. at the Madison Planned Parenthood. And, you know, training your kids up in the way they will go I means sometimes you take them with you into mm. some dark places. Yeah. And mm. you know, obviously we have good precautions. But Jared, you know, from day one, blessed me, prayed with me, said, yeah, I, if you feel like that's where God's calling you. And he's been just, a, just as much a visionary and and driver behind the scenes of Abundant Life as, uh, as anybody that's involved. So we've worked at this together since uh, the inception of Abundant Life. Wow. Yeah, and that's jumping great. off that, Abundant Life fully realized this vision to bring together uh, nonprofits in Washington State around this life-affirming, gospel-centered issue. So a nonprofit to nonprofits, and we began to realize, well, of these six main areas that a woman needs, what's missing, and it's the church. Mm -hmm. All of these organizations would say, we've got the checks of churches, but we don't have the hearts of churches. Mm -hmm. And we've continued to explore that further, you know, uh, these people that you resource and serve, what is like the single biggest need you have trying to connect them to a church or, you know, bring out, you've, you've walked this journey with them for a short period of time. What's the long-term plan? Yeah. And none of them said that they just need more money from churches. They said, we need churches that have a plan. We need churches that understand the issue. We need churches that are willing to just receive in, make that warm connection and love somebody. Yeah. And Beth began to explore, you know, what organizations out there are doing this well, what organizations have the best training and we found love life and vetted them for a couple of years and <laughs> blown away, <laughs> you know, blown away by the leadership, their hearts. A lot of them are pastors themselves. Mm -hmm. The vision, it was exactly what's missing, you know, yeah. the, and the connection to the church. If we can't do this without the church, yeah. what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And we believe that the church is the organization, only organization on the planet with the Jesus answer. Yeah, right. So I stepped into the Washington state love life catalyst role. Uh, many, people are afraid to meet with pastors you know that feels intimidating and I'm like ah that's no big deal <laughs> you know is I've it done as hard as their senior <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the senior well, <laughs> yeah yeah and that takes a lot more training I think um, but yeah conversations with pastors and just say hey what's your plan and a lot of them will say oh we got that covered we're just going to send them to the PRC mm -hmm. no 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 Oftentimes these women, they've raised three children. Mm -hmm. They, they don't need that. What's your plan? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Um, I have none. Wow. And that's where we come in. We get to bless mm -hmm. pastors with a plan. We're not looking to add to their plate. We've got a fully realized plan of how their church can step up and become a house mm -hmm. of refuge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I mean, obviously we met you guys through the love life conference that we hosted at Cedar park, but, um, then connecting with you guys again as a church and setting up Cedar Park as a house of refuge mm -hmm. yeah. was really special. Yeah, it was. Because, I mean, I'm hearing, you know, you guys describe the heartbeat and the mission, which in many ways is the heartbeat and the mission of the biblical church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Right. answering needs, bringing hope, you know, connecting people. And so uh, I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, yeah, that was our connection and introduction uh, to you guys. First, Beth looking for a, a church that would host the Love Life Conference. I think we ran into each other in the hallway. It was like, let's go. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. And the chance to connect with and meet uh, your husband. Yeah. And then to walk together mm -hmm. uh, following that event and really uh, be, be one of those churches yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that says mm -hmm. we will be a house of refuge, especially for those in those terrible places where they don't know what to do, where mm -hmm. they don't know who's around them, who's in their corner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that hard work that you guys yeah. are doing. It's working. Yeah. So reading that statement to our church mm -hmm. about how we will respond to women mm -hmm. and you know, in situations that you have unplanned pregnancies. I loved that. And I think it just even, you know, you could just feel our church responding in a way of like, 
Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, yeah that's who we want to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We want to yeah. love those yeah. that are in tough places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We think of it as an outside the church issue, but often at times it's really very much an inside the church issue. Right. We hear stories yeah. all the time, pastors coming on board. I read the statement and, you know, five people came forward mm-hmm. Over 20 people came forward, you know, uh, yeah. one church, it was nearly their entire church came forward, you know, different mm-hmm. ways that they've been touched by the tragedy mm-hmm. of abortion. And uh, the common thing that they're always saying is, you know, I, if I'm to be honest, I, I did know Jesus, but I wasn't surrendering this area of my life, yeah. this unconfessed mm-hmm. abortion. And that's what we want to see change. And the chains are loosed once yeah. they have that, yeah. you know, repentance that the yeah. enemy wants nothing more than to keep it in the darkness. So exactly. if we can help our brothers and sisters yeah. bring this, you know, into the light and find freedom from it, it, re- it revolutionizes our yeah, church. Right. But it is funny, this isn't like earth shattering, you know, theology. This is just the body of Christ. Yeah. I mean, what Abundant yeah. Life is doing is honoring the yeah. different body parts that are mm-hmm. doing these, you know, yeah. different works mm-hmm. in our community yeah. and That's not good. trying to center it squarely on the shoulders of the poor pregnancy clinics that are wonderful and doing such important mm-hmm. work. But, you know, growing up, I felt like doing my baby bottle campaign, which is important, please do it, uh, was throwing <laughs> pennies at a million dollar problem. It was mm-hmm. always, but what else? Like how this is such mm-hmm. a massive crisis. What mm-hmm. can we do as Christians? And I think that is the question we have to ask. I don't have the answer to that. I have the answer to a lot of the ways people are doing it. And I can share that. And I'd love to share that. But we have to really get on our knees and ask the Lord, what would you have of me? Mm-hmm. What would you have of our yeah. family, of yeah. our church? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jared often says that, you know, we as a, as a evangelical America are sort of looking at what we're going to outsource this problem to these parachurch ministries. All of the parachurch ministries are basically starving for good, wow. solid churches like you guys mm-hmm. that are not just willing, Jared always says this, I'm stealing it, but are ready and able. Yeah. yeah. So willingness is great, but mm-hmm. we really have to have good training and be ready mm-hmm. and able to That's receive good. these women. They're, yeah. they're coming from oftentimes very broken situations. That's what I love about this podcast is mm-hmm. we're getting to hear what does that yeah. story sound like? Yeah. And it's very eye-opening, I think, yeah. for all of us that have been listening to it. Yeah. And I believe the truth is that most pastors really are willing. They just mm-hmm. don't know a way. That wasn't covered mm-hmm. in seminary. Yeah. How do we navigate right. these true. issues? Yeah. Very yeah. True. So yeah, there is a life-changing difference between a church that is only willing and a church that is actually ready and able to act. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if there is a pastor listening right now or a church, what that's saying, I want to be a house of refuge. What does that look like for them? What do they need to do? Yeah. Well, one of the best places to start, you can go to lovelife.org or just uh, get on your Google, your search engine, type in love life house of refuge. It'll take you to the page and Mm -hmm. it has a really great explanation and probably a five minute read with a two minute video. Uh, It has a house of refuge statement and yeah, check it out. And we'd love to get in touch. Anybody from love life can explain how the house of refuge model works and it's spreading like wildfire around this nation right now uh we're almost at a thousand churches that have come on board to say we're going to be a house of refuge (laughs) and um i think there's probably going to be a thousand more you know in the next Mm -hmm. year or two uh the exciting thing is as we started with three in washington state we now have 25 and we've launched love life canada through some pastors up in the fraser valley that are getting passionate about about this. And now a couple in Oregon. Yeah, so it's spreading yeah, beyond what we yeah. really thought we were sort of starting. Yeah, with Oregon the was a void and yeah. yeah, it's spreading to Oregon. It's in California. We're in 14 states. Yeah. Yeah. So That's for, great. you know, Jay and Sandy and Marlene who just shocked us with their support for the conference and really day of like it would have been a disaster without Marlene especially (laughs) Um, it's it's pretty amazing to have such hopes and and prayers for something like that conference and our main prayer was Lord please don't let this die out here I mean there was a point in my in my walk where um, he really called me very specifically to pro-life ministry and I just remember leaving the event I was at and just praying the entire way home Lord don't let this fire die Mm -hmm. because it's so easy for the things of the world and the pressures of family and raising kids and you know being a faithful wife and whatever we're trying to do to choke out the other callings that God has put on our life and so you know just ask him for that passion and you know I can tell you eight nine years later it's burning brighter than it ever has and that's not me that's Christ Mm -hmm. in me so I'm really thankful for his Mm -hmm. guiding in this and his specific calling um 
you know, for me, it even came through a dream that really, you know, I won't go into detail about, but it was, it was very poignant in that it was largely surrounding the fact that we are, our country, our nation has been built on the bodies of these little babies. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to get people to look at what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's really what the, the um, wow. heart of the dream was. And so I didn't know it at wow. the time, but that was really the Lord's warning that it's going to be hard to get the church to look at this. It's wow. not fun to look at. No. Mm -hmm. None of us want to. Right. right. I'm not going to say this is yeah. what we had planned for. We wanted to lead music. Come on. This, is, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't what we had planned for our life, but it's so rich and beautiful. Yeah. And it's really become part of the DNA of our family to um, raise our kids in an awareness of the, the difficulties we're facing mm -hmm. as a church in America and not just, you know, shy away from it. So, yeah. Well, thank you guys for your stand mm -hmm. for life. Mm -hmm. And I just um, think about your story, Beth, of just being a young mom and just asking Jesus, what can I do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can I serve? And I think that is what Jesus responds to, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes, you know, people probably look at you right now and they think, wow, Beth and Jared, like you guys are really doing it. And you are. But I mean, it started small, yeah. right? It just started with a prayer mm -hmm. and a dream and a willingness and a willingness. You know, instead of me trying to drive mm -hmm. my own destiny, it was like, all right, Lord, I guess I should let you <laughs> do that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And I just yeah. think if everyone, mm -hmm. you know, around our state, mm -hmm. every believer just had that posture, right. like, how can you use me, God? Just mm -hmm. how, however you want to use me, I'm, I'm available, mm -hmm. that our world would change. You know, it's funny that you say people don't want to look at it. I started following live action on Instagram mm. and we were sitting around our dinner table last night and my daughter opened up her phone and I had already seen their post yesterday. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys follow live action, but they had posted a video of aborted babies. Mm -hmm. mm. And you know, that's not something when you open Instagram that you're like, Oh, let's see what, mm -hmm. let's go look at, you know, what my friend's doing. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, and it took me a minute to figure out what it was. So then I, so as soon as she did it at the dinner table, she was like, oh, and she slams her phone down. And I was like, I know what you saw because yeah. I just saw that too. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I just, I don't even want to look at that. And we don't. Mm -hmm. Right. But but yeah. we have to. Mm -hmm. But not at the dinner table. Right. <laughs> right. right. It's phones. okay to have some phones boundaries on the phones. Yeah. Phones in general at the dinner yeah. table. It's not yeah. a great yeah. plan, yeah. but yeah. Yes. Phones yeah. at the dinner table, not good. But, you know, one of the things, and I, we're jumping out of order, but just hearing it, you know, as a pastor, um, you know, we often feel like, well, we have to be the one, the champion to push these issues forward. And oftentimes that's the way, you know, it's just a, a decision, a moment, a direction that the church takes. But one of the things that is really beautiful, Jared, as you were talking and Beth, is that uh, there are people in the community of the church that are um, more passionate mm -hmm. and more equipped about these issues. Absolutely. And the more that yeah. pastors will lean into the things that like, okay, I know this is the heart of Jesus. I yeah. just don't know if people are going to receive it. Right. It's like just one little moment of courage. Yeah. And sometimes that yeah. moment of courage comes uh, as someone in a congregation says, Hey, Hey pastor, are we going to say something about this? Mm -hmm. And I know mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, that if everybody's issue and everybody's thought, you know, it can't always be addressed, but sometimes pastors don't talk about abortion. They don't talk about life. They don't talk about adoption. They don't talk about these things mm -hmm. because they feel like, well, it's too painful for some people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people may not be on board, yeah. but I just think the more I hear from people in our congregation um, about this is something they're passionate about, it it emboldens and empowers. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things I've discovered. And, you know, other pastors, or let me just say other, if you're a part of a congregation, you said, oh, man, I wish my pastor or I wish our church would, would kind of address or talk about this issue maybe just your loving conversation to your pastor just saying hey this is something i'm passionate about is enough courage for them to open the door mm -hmm. and Absolutely. that door being open might lead to a 26th uh church being mm -hmm. a house of yeah. refuge in washington yeah. state a, a 27th a hundredth a thousand maybe there'd be a thousand churches in washington state and there's just a just one step of boldness just one step of courage that opens the door that helps uh, so we're not throwing pennies at a million dollar problem, we're throwing a million heart, you know, just mm -hmm. on fire, Jesus loving, passionate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, disciples mm -hmm. at a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. say courage. Mm -hmm. Is that, mm -hmm. have you felt, do you, have you felt trepidation when you've brought these issues like on a Sunday morning to church and you're talking about abortion or like, what is that? How has that process been for you yeah. as a pastor? Well, one of the things I think that I'm really, amazingly grateful to pastor a church that has a legacy of speaking on these issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of churches that are maybe church plants or they're brand new, or maybe they're following 
uh, in the footsteps of a church whose model was built on making people feel comfortable or not stepping on toes. Right. But I'm grateful to, to follow in the footsteps of your dad, mm -hmm. who was our pastor <laughs> since you know I was little, and just hearing bold stances mm -hmm. and hearing uh, these issues brought up. But I think you are mm -hmm. sensitive to what's going on in people's lives, and you don't want to like, you know stick a pour salt in a wound yeah. or you don't want to bring issues up but it's also true so yes you feel I, I wouldn't say trepidation or intimidation but maybe it's sometimes even out of empathy or compassion um but i think the other thing that's interesting is like in feeling those those issues there the outside of the church there is a strong cultural resistance mm -hmm. to the yeah. church making traditional biblical stands mm -hmm. you know yeah. and it goes usually something mm -hmm. like Hey, that may have that may have been the church when your grandparents were here, but they're not here anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the church has evolved. You know, we yeah. we mm -hmm. now um, we now have have an enlightened view about these things, right. it, which is really just garbage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that message is really strong outside, and sometimes I think we um, we listen too much to it. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage pastors to listen to um, those people in their congregation that are passionate and and just love Jesus. Mm -hmm and see these issues because there's like they're pro-life people in every congregation yeah. i mean even the ones um that are not talking about it and they're just waiting so be a be a squeaky wheel mm -hmm. you know do, do you feel at all that there's any validity to to it just either uh ignorance or even just chosen ignorance mm -hmm. with pastors and, and i don't mean that in a judgmental way but once you see the brokenness mm -hmm. you have to respond so it's almost just if I, I can't get too close to that because there's so many different things of overwhelmed. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to choose to keep that door closed. Yeah. Makes me wonder. Yeah, yeah. that's true. I think you're. I think you're right. Um, you know, or it's what's true is like in, like everything Beth mentioned. It there's so many things in our lives that are important. Right. And you yeah. just go. I know it's important, but there's a lot of other important things. Mm -hmm. We may mm -hmm. we may not even call it ignorance mm -hmm. or even just like shoving it away. We're like, oh, I'm just throwing myself into more important things, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, it's kind of like you got to start somewhere. And I think life is a really great place mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think no that kidding. churches have like callings? Or I didn't mean to like quote that. <laughs> 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 quote. You know, we're like, well, that's, you know, they talk about mm. political issues at that church or they talk about mm. life and abortion. In our church, we just, we do this. I don't know. Many will say we preach the gospel. We don't get into any of that. I'm like, yeah. how do you yeah, preach the gospel preach without the Good Samaritan? Mm -hmm. That's you know? actually right. a common thing. You know, can you get involved? Would you like to even have a discuss? Would you pastor even like to come and have a discussion with other pastors yeah. about yeah. this in your community? Oh no, no, you have to understand. We just preach the Bible here, mm. and yeah, it's so, crazy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. But I think the question of like, I think different churches have. Uh, passionate issues yeah. Yeah. yeah, that, um, you know, like, obviously I think that every church that's preaching the Bible should be passionate about life. Mm -hmm. um, some are going to go more in on how mm -hmm. do they, how do they equip that? Right. Um, it's not an excuse for anybody to shy away. Some mm -hmm. churches are more passionate about reconciliation. Some churches are more passionate about adoption. Some churches are more passionate Homeless. about homelessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I think right. that's why any one single church isn't enough to fill the need, yeah, yeah. we right. need each other, yes. but we also need to acknowledge, support, yeah. um, instead of criticize and fight uh, each other, um, to say, well, well, we don't we don't talk about that. I think a, a calling is what you do embrace yeah. more than mm -hmm. what you say, well, we don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's an aversion. That's really well said. I think it's mm -hmm. easy to look at other people. I mean, well, I'll take me as an example. I'll just throw myself out there. When I started in sidewalk ministry, you get a little, you know, oh, well, this is so important. Everybody should be doing Why isn't right. everybody down here? Yep. Everybody right. would come do this. And my wonderful, steady, even kill husband, I'm like ranting at him one day when I get home and, you know, and hi, this is so great. And that's so important. And probably a lot of self-importance that comes, you know, we, mm -hmm. we battle our pride in these things. And he just looks at me and he's like, it's like, all right, I hear you. What about our friends who are serving in Papua New Guinea? Like, should they come home immediately and go out on this? I'm like, no, that's different, obviously. But then he kind of walked it back. What about, a, you know, a pastor that is leading an entire church? And he'd be down there all the time with you. 
okay, well, probably not the pastor. Like, you know, we just, we have to focus on what God's called us to. Yes. And then mm-hmm. I think that's, you just said it really well. We have mm-hmm. to be honoring to other people and what mm-hmm. they are doing, appeal to, you know, their their knowledge of the gospel. If God calls them to something very specific, mm-hmm. then they'll do it. I, I believe it. If the Holy Spirit's moving, they're, they're eventually yeah. going to do it, just like he, he didn't let us off the hook and, yeah. and chased us down with what our calling was. But, right. but at some level, everybody can do something. Mm-hmm. And I think that's Good. the challenge yeah. that Love Life puts out there a lot. Of, you're not all going to do the same things we are not all the same part of the body, but we can all do something about Mm -hmm. this major number one moral crisis that we're facing in America. Yeah. And if we're to be honest, there's studies that are revealing somewhere between 40 to possibly 56% of the people in a congregation have personally been touched by the tragedy of abortion. Mm -hmm. So what what more number one issue is actually happening inside a church? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All we're asking is for pastors to clear the air and say, you know, this is what we believe. Mm -hmm. This is a safe place you're loved we're here to provide hope healing and walk with you in jesus Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. wow tremendous powerful yeah well let's shift a little bit to (laughs) talking about foster care and adoption and while you two are not married (laughs) no we've already clarified that (laughs) but but we're becoming we're both married just not to each other yes Yes. (laughs) you both have beautiful stories of adoption so we'll start ladies first okay with marlene if you could just share a little bit about your guys' story and well i want to kind of tag on to what you guys are talking about so we don't want women to have abortions. We want Mm -hmm. to support them. And some choose to have their children and to raise them, but then some just simply can't. Mm -hmm. And so what is, I think, the church solution to that? Well, we want to bring them into our homes. We want to adopt them. And that's kind of where our story starts. And so my husband and I have been married for almost 31 years. We have four children, three grandchildren. Um, Mm -hmm. Our two oldest Roman and Alexis are our biological and our two youngest we adopted. And so Jason and I knew we wanted to adopt before we were even engaged. We both Mm -hmm. talked that even if we weren't married to each other, adoption was going to be part of our family. And so um, when we got married, we also had decided we wanted to do older kids because older children are harder to Adopt, Josh can probably go into some of that a little later, but um, they're harder to place in adoptive homes. And we wanted to do a sibling group to keep kids' families together. And those are also harder to place because a lot of parents want to start with one, kind of get their feet wet. And so, um, so we had our biological children first, Roman and Lexi came first. And Um, So we were busy raising them, but about the time they were ready to kind of head into the tween years, God just kind of reminded us of the conversations we had and what he had really laid on our hearts to do. And so we went down the road of adoption. We started taking classes. We started with Antioch Adoptions, and then Olive Crest was actually our... um, Licensing. Our licensing, yeah, agency. And so we... um, they fast tracked us because we wanted older children. And so we got through our process in about six months. And then um, Zoe and Judah were placed with us. And six months to the day that they moved in with us, their adoption was finalized. Mm -hmm. And so they were seven and almost nine at the time. They are now 23 and 25. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the last 15 years, it's hard. It's very, it can be very hard and not just for us, but for them as well because of what they've gone through. And so um, I don't know what we would have done without the family support and without Cedar Park because that's where our kids went to school. It's where, it's, it's our place of worship. It's our second family and it's where we belong. And they just came around us and supported us through the difficult times I worked for your dad mm-hmm. um, when we had kind of when we were going through the really difficult stuff with our younger son because they're older, they've gone through stuff. Mm-hmm. There's just issues that they have that your biological kids don't have because of what they've experienced, what they've seen, what yeah. they've been put through. Mm-hmm. And um, so there were, it was a period of two years I was working for Pastor Joe. And once a week, I had to be gone for three hours because Judah needed to have some pretty intense therapy. Mm-hmm. And um, the church, I mean, Pastor Joe just supported us through that. The other staff would just fill the gaps where I couldn't be there. Mm-hmm. 
and um, so I'm so grateful. The church is a very important part of raising these kids and um, just the support that we mm-hmm. got. And it is, it's kind of, it can be messy, but it's rewarding. Mm-hmm. And so through our adoption, we just thought we were going to adopt and we would be done. But um, once you kind of get into the foster care system and you see the need, uh, we became foster parents. So after we adopted, we, um, we did foster care um, for 10 years until we had, until the grandkids came. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we were with Olive Crest the, the whole time. And so we've had lots of kids wow. through our home and we rarely had little kids. We always had sibling groups and more of the early teen um, kids. They just, yeah. it fit with our family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's kind of, what kind of, that's kind of our story. I know a lot of people like romanticize adoption. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I don't. I think probably mm-hmm. every couple mm-hmm. has at some point said, "Oh, well, you know, maybe should we adopt or at least yeah. had a conversation mm-hmm. about it." But like, what what brought you guys over that mm-hmm. step of That's it just being question. a dream or mm-hmm. an idea to we're gonna do this and we're gonna take the first step? Do you remember that? Moment you know, or? I I don't know that there was a moment. We just always knew, okay. like from our, that first conversation. But I feel like when our kids, our biological kids, got to a certain age, yeah. God reminded us mm-hmm. again. I think it was just Him reminding us, "Hey, I birthed that in you," mm-hmm. and it may have been laying dormant for a while as right. you've been raising wow. these other kids, and now it's time. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. just being open to that because we were very comfortable right. with the two kids that we had. It was a great life. And so you do, I do think most people romanticize it. And even like we had really good training through Olive Crest. We had really good training through Antioch adoptions, but they cannot fully prepare you for when the kids are in your home. There's just no way. Right. And, um, it, it is hard. I'll just be honest. It is very, very hard work. Yeah. And, um, you know, one thing for Jason and I is the kids coming into your homes, they really are victims because what has happened to them is through no fault of their own. Right. Right. But as you're raising them, there's a turning point where you can't allow them to kind of play the victim. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, now we have to start dealing with these issues because we need you to be a responsible mm-hmm. adult yeah. and not kind of go down the path that your family went down. And so for our kids, I would always think Mother's Day would be a hard day for them because they, um, they knew their mom. I mean, they were seven and nine when they came to us and, um, they were living with their aunt and uncle for a couple of years. Their mom was in, um, in jail or in prison. And so they lived with her and, um, their mom just never came back to get them when she got out of jail. So the aunt put them up for adoption. She had five kids of her own realizing that she couldn't take care of them. And so you think of the abandonment mm-hmm. issues. And so, but, but they also still have a very close tie. It's like, of there's course. a loyalty there yeah. to that bio yeah. mom. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I remember, I think it was the first mother's day I had asked them, I said, you know, are you thinking about her? And they were like, yeah, Kind of, but it wasn't a big deal. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to push it. And then it was a couple months after um, Judah came to me just out of the blue and kind of started talking to me. And he was like, he was mad. Like mm. she could have come and gotten us. Mm. Why didn't she? Mm. Yeah. And then he just sits in my lap and he just cries because mm. he feels that, he feels that loss. Um, and so then he starts after the anger he starts talking about his biological mom and so just being able to listen to him and Mm -hmm. so i just asked him i said you know when you're thinking about her and you want to say something to her would it be helpful if we got like just a little chest and you could like write things or maybe when you know it's close to her birthday on mother's day if you want to buy her a gift or you remember something she liked we can do that and we can put it in this chest and it was a closed adoption the Mm -hmm. state they recommended that it be a closed adoption Um, but of course, when they reach 18, then they can make the decision. And so, um, both 
of the kids liked that idea. And so um, I just said, well, when you guys feel that, you just let us know and we'll get what we need and we'll wrap it and we'll put it, we'll put the year, what you were thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, not once. There was not one note that has gone mm -hmm. in it, not one gift, not one anything. And so sometimes I think it's just that they can they get, get it out. Yeah. Mm. And we've never, yeah. ever spoke anything <clears throat> negative about their biological yeah. mom. I just always said, I don't know how she was raised. I don't know what she went through that caused her to make the decisions that she did. But I'm grateful that she had you. I'm yeah. grateful that she chose life because our family wouldn't be complete yeah. if we didn't have you. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. Um, it has been challenging sometimes. And um, our daughter, Zoe, who is 25, we just kind of went through, when she became an adult, we went through a couple years of just challenging where there was kind of some separation there and just allowing her to go through what she needed to and just taking a step back. And the last year she's, you know, been in our life and her and her boyfriend are coming for dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. And so you just go through all of these things with them and it's a roller coaster. It yeah. really is... Um, but again, the support from the church and just the faithfulness of God. Yeah. And we, Jason and I have always said this, if he calls us to it, he's going to equip us for it. Yeah. And he yeah. has equipped us. Mm -hmm. And we have not always been the best parents that we've done things what? out of frustration and anger <laughs> um, where you have to go back and say, yeah, that probably wasn't the best thing. And even as our kids are adults and they like reminisce about things and they're laughing about situations, yeah. you know, <laughs> but like growing up, you're like, I see said that oh, yeah, right. I did that well yeah. they think it's funny and you're just like that was awful I can't believe I said that and so um that's a whole nother chest filled with other kind of yes, exactly, right? yes. Yeah. and so um you know just loving them through what they're going through and I think mm -hmm. you know early on we also felt God speak to us that this isn't about you when we're mm -hmm. feeling rejected by them or we're mm -hmm. feeling like we're doing all of this for you and all you right. don't appreciate anything just realizing that this isn't about you yeah. it is about them and about leading them to Christ and having them have a Christ-centered relationship mm -hmm. and um so yeah, that's just kind of a glimpse into mm -hmm. our life for the last 15 years. One of the things, oops, one of the things that I just so appreciate hearing you, you say, you know, even thinking about that moment with the chest, mm -hmm. that that child was comfortable enough to be in a safe environment mm -hmm. to ask that question. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of core memories, you know, that's going to be one. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think for so many of our foster families that have said yes to this, it's actually a decision to run to the pain than yeah. running from the pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and when we look at the center of the gospel, that's what Christ did for all of us. It's, it's looking true. at wow. the center, center of our pain mm -hmm. and was willing to run to it yeah. other than run from it. There's no question that it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, but what do we want to do with that? Yeah. So thank you mm. for saying yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you speak like a guy with a heart for foster <laughs> families. About and it's and, like he gets it. And like a yeah. pastor. You're like this crazy combination. <laughs> that's good, man. Thank you. I love that. Thanks, senior. <laughs> so fast, senior. appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, Josh, tell us tell us your story. Yeah, so uh, we, we have a lot of ties to foster care mm -hmm. as well. Uh, my wife and I got married when we were 18 and 20 and knew everything, so why wouldn't we adopt too? <laughs> um, but we got, we got married really young, and my, my wife's parents have had over 125 foster kids oh, to their wow. house. Uh, I grew up just really, uh, I just didn't understand or know the need. Um, but we got married, and a few months in, my in-laws brought in uh, a baby day one out of the hospital, <clears throat> and we fell in love with him. Mm -hmm. And so about six months into being married, we decided to bring him into our house. And so that, pr that process started. I wish it would have been six months for us. Uh, it was about a year and a half where he came in permanent, and he wasn't nine until the adoption was finalized. So wow. it took a lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that just really started to birth a passion in me of, uh, you know, God placed this in my heart that I didn't know how to articulate until about five years ago, but that praying for suffering kids isn't enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt like it was personal, but the more that I lean into that, I think that's the gospel. Um, you know, there's a moment with Jesus where, and I, I grew up in the church, I believe that prayer makes a difference, it moves mountains. Yeah. And Jesus would take times to retreat, and then he would come back and he'd get to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, I just felt the Lord calling me to advocate for this from a young mm -hmm. age. And so I, I came into ministry just kind of with that bend. 
Uh, and then, so we adopted him, and then I have two bio kids, uh, Lane and Graham, who are 13 and uh, 5. Um, my, f- my youngest, Nora, we adopted as well. Uh, her birth mom was one of my, my youth students when I was a youth pastor. Mm. And uh, she came into a difficult season, was going to abort her baby. If she was sitting here, this is what she would tell you. The, the night before she was supposed to go through with it, God woke her up out of her sleep. And she just decided, I don't know what I can do, but I know I can't do this. Wow. And so she called her mom, they called their pastor, then they called us mm-hmm. and asked if we would consider adopting this baby. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this gal did the bravest thing that I think any mm-hmm. woman could do and decided to have a baby that she wouldn't raise. And mm-hmm. so Nora, her middle name is Abigail, that, um, and that's after birth mom for just an expression of hope. Yeah. And so my wife is at every doctor's appointment all the way through and um, found out in the middle of that we were pregnant. And so uh, <laughs> we have two five-year-olds that are essentially <laughs> twins. <laughs> um, you know, amazing. so that, that's a quick, quick version for the family side. But this is something we've cared about for a long time. My whole ministry has been in the church. I planted a church and then worked for the Northwest Ministry Network for Assembly of God Churches for multiple years. Really, it's how I've been able to get to know mm-hmm. Pastor Jay and Sandy. And through that, what I shared just a moment ago of praying for suffering kids isn't enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I started meeting with nonprofits uh, and asking questions mm-hmm. and just, what, what are you doing to make a difference in this area? Because mm-hmm. I just feel the Lord impressing on my heart. I'm going to be a part of this. And through that, I met Paul LaRose, who's our regional director for Washington. And he asked me to apply for the job just in the fall. So I've been there a little over six months. And I said yes and got into the process and uh, really left a very wonderful, comfortable job uh, that I could have been in for my career that I loved and was passionate about. Uh, But I felt the Lord calling me to run to the pain Mm -hmm. than run from the pain. And so we stepped into this career at Olive Crest full time. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Well, and we're, our church is excited to have mm-hmm. you guys come and share with us in November, I think. Yep. But what are ways that you do want to partner with churches yeah. and that you can partner, and not just with churches, but the families mm-hmm. represented mm-hmm. inside and ways that you can be a tangible yep. place for families? Yeah. Olive Crest's slogan is, uh, everyone can't foster a kid, but everyone can do something. Yeah. And, uh, really you know, good. so Olive Crest mm-hmm. is a, we're a faith-based nonprofit involved in the child welfare system. So our, kind of our bread and butter is foster and adoptive mm-hmm. care. But we all also offer, offer a lot of resources even for kids that are aging out of the system. Uh, you know, when I think about the need and how a church can respond, over 60% of foster kids that age out will be homeless. Mm-hmm. Um, 60%. And then Las Vegas University will put out the statistic next, next year. But 85% of those that are involved in the sex trafficking industry have ties to foster care. Mm -hmm. You know, we see in scripture that God talks often uh, about love, but rarely does he prescribe how to do it. Uh, Mm -hmm. But he does with orphans and widows Mm -hmm. and the work that we're deciding to be in. And so, you know, to your question earlier, Pastor Jay, on, uh, you know, our, 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 I think it was you, Sandy, how how is the church, like, do they have areas? And everything in me says yes. And God made it clear. Yeah. We can't all foster, but we all can do something. Mm -hmm. And so, all of Crest, there's multiple ways. Obviously, the awareness to continue to bring to. The, there's a massive need for more foster families. Mm-hmm. I was on a panel with a gal uh, about six weeks ago. She was pulled from her home when she was 14. Uh, horrifically, horrifically abused emotionally um, and physically. And she's in front of this church sharing her story. When she was pulled at 14, uh, she was sitting in the police station with a bag with all the stuff that they told her to fill. She had a few minutes before she was pulled. And the police officer told her, we don't actually have a foster home for you right now, so your only option is a woman's homeless shelter in downtown Seattle. At 14. At 14. And so this, this girl is in front of these people sharing a story, and she, she would tell you that I would have rather gone back to the horrific abuse I was experiencing than to have to set, step into a new area of danger not knowing what could be. Yeah. And I think about that girl often when I think mm-hmm. about the work that we're in. And mm-hmm. there's just need for more homes. Our program director for West Sound had 10 calls last week, and she had to say no to all 10 because mm-hmm. we just don't have a foster home available. Mm-hmm. So the, the need for creating awareness will continue to grow for more yeah. foster families that love kids. Uh, but also a huge area that we're able to really advocate for our foster families. They're called care communities, 
but they're just wrapped around support for a church to be what they're best at, which is loving people. Mm -hmm. You know, 60 years ago, a uh, foster care system didn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all done through the local church. And so... Mm -hmm. 60 years. 60 mm -hmm. years, that's it. Wow. And it started with a great need. And so the state decided to do a good thing to fund this. Uh, but other than a beautiful partnership, the church really took a back seat. Hmm. And so Care Communities allows the church to take a front-running seat again to advocate for our kids, where they actually rally around a foster family. Hmm. So over 50% of foster families that open their license close in the first year, because as you shared, it's mm -hmm. really hard work and it's mm -hmm. lonely. Yeah. You know, someone gets pregnant and has a child, there's, there's kind of this celebration in the nine-month process, mm -hmm. and usually after there might be meal trains or mm -hmm. things are dropped off, no one thinks to do that for a foster family, but the responsibility for that family is the same. Mm -hmm. And so a care community wraps around a foster family, offering a meal once a week and offering just to pray for them. Uh, over 90% of foster families that have a care community last more than two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the need is significant. The responsibility is small, but it makes a massive difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just at a loss, you know, <laughs> because I think of the need is so great. Mm -hmm. How you, you said not everyone can adopt, but who can, Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, like what, yeah. I just think, what is it that is going to propel people mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. and to, to hear God say, you can do it. Like, yeah. Are there indicators? Are there like like obvious things you can just tick off right away? Like, hey, you'd be a great candidate if this. Yeah. Um, like maybe what are some of those things that like are good reasons for people to consider adoption yeah. or consider fostering? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> you know, the, uh, we would say at Olive Crest is Jesus at the center of your heart, mm -hmm. and do you have a safe, loving home? Mm -hmm. You've you've crossed the biggest barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of our our best foster families are single women and uh, elderly couples. We have a couple that's in their late 60s that have three foster kids in their home and they've been foster parents for over 15 years. Wow. Mm. Uh, you know, the, I think there's a lot of things that we, we say that, because as we said before, the need is, it's hard, it's, yeah. it's heartbreaking. Every single story yeah. that comes through our door, this child experienced trauma and right. that's why it was, they were removed. Mm -hmm. But you know, even in the, the state system, uh, two full-time parents, the state offers child care support. So even if two people work full-time, they'll cover the cost for those that foster child to be in foster, or in child care mm -hmm. during that whole time. So, so much of it is just a willingness to ask questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's in the foster care system too, there's other ways, other ways to lean in with respite is a pretty well-known program where it's foster family needs vacation or just a break. Yeah. Uh, it's short-term mm -hmm. care in the foster care system. Mm -hmm. But there's also short-term placement when a child's pulled in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, we have incredible families that will have that child for three to five days, but they get the call at four in the mor mm -hmm. morning with a two-year-old that doesn't have a home mm -hmm. or a 14, 15-year-old. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's, there really, is it a safe, loving home? And are you willing to open up a bedroom? Yeah, because Marlene, you guys did respite. We did respite. Too. We did foster care. So we would have kids with us up to um, two years. Some we would have for just a few days because they're trying to find a placement closer to the services for that kid or where that child goes to school. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our, when we had younger kids, the state did pay because I worked, Jason worked, and so they would mm -hmm. pay for the daycare. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, drop them off. And um, oh, there was something else that you said. Oh, do you find that because there aren't as many families, they're not taking kids out of situations that probably maybe should? They're, it's like the most dire situations yeah. that they are now taking kids yeah. out of because they don't have homes to put them in. Yes. You can speak to that, I, I, I'm I sure. can. In July, a huge house bill just went through that, that are, will greatly affect the foster care system in our state. And the, the number one reason a child's been pulled for the entire time of child welfare is neglect. Mm -hmm. uh, the state's changed the language now to where it's imminent, imminent danger that a child's pulled uh, for many, many different reasons. And sadly, in politics, there's things that we don't get to see because it, they seem to lack sense at times mm -hmm. for the child. I would say right now in the system, the, the uh, goal and agenda is the bio parents over the foster child. Yes, yes. 
Now, I think all of us, even if we look at the gospel, uh, reconciliation is best. Mm -hmm. Nora that I talked about that we adopted, the best thing that would have been for her is for her mom to be in a place where she could have kept her. Mm -hmm. But because God is good, he reconciled the story. So all of Crest is for that. When reconciliation is best and it's safe, we want that for our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, because of these changes, um, a lot of kids are being pulled later, Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're going home sooner. So I think there's a lot of things that play into that. But if there were more foster families, Mm -hmm. there's no question that we would see a bigger area of need. Also, because of that, the kids that are being placed, the trauma is twice as bad. Yes. And so the the sad part that you don't see on the news or in statistics, because it doesn't paint a good picture, but more kids are dying in these homes, Mm -hmm. um, in these bio homes, because they're they're going home sooner and and it's not safe. Mm -hmm. You know, I will say one thing that Jason and I tried to do, um, I'll share, we had a brother and a sister, they were in their early teens, and we had them for about six months. Their mom was in jail, she was doing her parenting classes, so she was doing what she was supposed to be doing while she was in there to get her kids back. And so... As foster parents, we, we want to support that. If we mm-hmm. feel it, they're going to be going back to their mom and it's going to be a good, safe environment. And so um, so once she got out of jail, she continued to do her services. She did all of her visits. Things were on track. Um, and so we started the reunification process. Mm-hmm. And um, it was great for the kids. They just absolutely loved it. So eventually we moved them you know, back into the home with their mom. And I think it was probably three or four months later. And um, we had been doing foster care, like one right after the other, like as soon as one would leave, then another one come in. So Jason was like, you know what, let's just take a few months just for our family. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just told Olive Crest, give us just a few months with just the, you know, Mm -hmm. our family, the six of us, and we'll jump back in. And so within that time, um, the daughter was at school one day of these foster kids that just went back to their mom. I, I think it had been a few months. They had been home. And um, I get a call. I'm working here at the church, and I get a call from her. And she said, my mom just called me and said that her parole officer stopped by, and she was testing dirty for drugs. Mm. And so she said, we're going back into care. She said, can we come and stay with you again? Mm. Wow. And I said, I will call your caseworker. I said, yes, we don't have anybody. You guys can come back with us. And so um, it was funny because I'm hanging up with her and the caseworker is calling me. She said, hey, I'm on my way to pick these kids up. Can we bring them to your house? And I was like, yep, I just got off the phone with her. Mm. So they were able to come back mm. with us. The mom went back to jail. She started doing all of her services again. Um, and I felt like it was a mom that really she wanted to do yep. well. She mm-hmm. just mm. wasn't equipped and she she yeah. was by herself yeah. and her influences, they were not good. Mm-hmm. And so this was, so we did reunifi- reunification again. I think they were with us. It was a little longer this time, like a year and a half. Mm. And um, when they went back this time, I talked to the mom and I just said, listen, if you are feeling overwhelmed Mm -hmm. or you need a break for a weekend or something like that, just call us. It doesn't have to go through the foster care system. Just call us Mm -hmm. and we'll take them. So she she did that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. they went to like winter camp with our youth group and um, they had developed relationships with our kids. So it was like, almost coming back to like an aunt and uncle's house. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so there, there, I remember one time she had her teenage son call me. She said, he is just not listening to me. And he said, he won't talk to anybody but you. (laughs) So he gets on the phone and he was the one when the social workers would come because they come once a month to just check on the kids and check on you. And um, so they would ask, you know, how are things going? And he would say, well, everything is good if she just wouldn't beat me every day and he just joking he just thought he was funny so the social worker he was just like yes Yes. um he was yeah i thought he was a comedian (laughs) and she was like you can't say that i can't put he was just joking in the report like you can't say that and so um so just having that Mm. conversation with him saying you know, your mom is trying the best that she can and you have to be respectful of her and she's not always going to make decisions that you like. You didn't like all the decisions that we made in our house, but she's doing it because she thinks it's best for you. And so 
It was such a great relationship. So the mom finally decided she had to get out of the area she was living in. She said, I just don't have good influences here. Yeah. And so she moved further, further north. And we still, we stayed in touch with them. So mm -hmm. sometimes we'd have to go, I think it was up to Arlington or Marysville and pick them up and bring them back. And that was a happy, I mm -hmm. love that story yeah. because that's what we want. If they can stay mm -hmm. with the mom or, and it's going to be a good situation because yep. that's mm -hmm. where the kids want to be. Best case scenario. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah. It really, it is. really yeah. is. One of the things that I love about uh, that we're seeing at Olive Crest is, you know, in the foster care system, um, we're not just wanting to offer a safe home with a safe bed, mm -hmm. but we want to offer a home where there's, a bedtime story mm -hmm. and that where mm -hmm. the identity of who they are is discussed. Mm -hmm. And for all of Crest, we're essentially on a pool when a child is placed where they'll, the state calls us and if we are able to place them, we get higher on the list mm -hmm. um, where they'll, they'll call us more often mm -hmm. uh, for these placements. But what we're believing is that we're able to change legacy. Mo most foster kids can look back two to three generations and their grandparents were foster kids. Mm, wow. So they've just repeated the same abuse because yeah. someone that's abused that is not uh, reset, yeah. all they know to do to love is to continue to abuse. Mm -hmm. And so we had, we had a gal that is in our I ILS independent living. Um, we were helping her with housing and we helped her open up a bank account. And she said she was the first one in three generations to open up a bank account because oh. her grandparents were foster kids. And so um, what we're hoping to continue to see is more families like yours that yeah. are willing to, that this is not just offering safety, but mm -hmm. identity and yeah. who you are in Christ mm -hmm. and what God sees in your story, being yeah. curious. Well, something I love about Marlene is just that, you know, that offer to go outside of the system and to yeah. just befriend and love, that's so yeah. scary to us. Like yeah. when mm -hmm. we step outside of our comfort zone, but also Josh is this idea of moving towards the pain. Like we are a mm -hmm. culture that, avoids mm -hmm. discomfort, mm -hmm. let alone pain, right. like the plague. That's and true. yet, you know, there's a, there's a great pastor that said, everybody wants to follow Jesus. It sounds so nice till you see where he's going <laughs> <laughs> up yeah. that hill to Calvary. Like that's what we're called to when he tells yeah. us to pick up our cross. And I, as I'm listening mm -hmm. to you guys, I mean, we're all different parts of the body. I'm like, how mm -hmm. do you do this? Is so amazing to me. Mm -hmm. But there's also somebody that shared this with me from love life, Daniel parks, one of their directors, uh, because it's dark to look at these things and to hear the trauma mm -hmm. that happens to these kids and just wrap your brain around the fact this is their reality and how can we live in such a broken world that we must never become more um, overcome by the horror of abortion or the yeah. trauma done to these kids than we are awed by the grace of Jesus. Mm -hmm. like how good. do we keep our eyes on it's him really good. And, and his uh, mm -hmm. love and care for us and how he took the hits for us yeah. and mm -hmm. become people who take the hits for others. Right. And I'm mm -hmm. getting to see this uh, from a, a relative front row seat with one mm -hmm. of my staffers who has uh, willingly brought in uh, from infancy, he was a little early, um, her half sister's uh, baby boy mm -hmm. has been raising him for these last six months. So wow. getting to see firsthand how they are taking the beatings basically for this little boy who is just so sweet. I mean, yeah. she's on our, our zoom team calls and he's always there grinning at all of us. And I'm like, this baby's such a miracle. And what they're doing for him <laughs> oh. is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's so hard. It's mm -hmm. so painful. Yeah. Uh, and yet there's so much good that mm -hmm. God brings out of that. So yes. it can be an overwhelming conversation to have. That's why we often shy away from yeah. this stuff because it's, it's scary to think mm -hmm. of how do we begin yeah. to meet these needs. It doesn't happen all at once. And I think that's no. something you guys sharing your stories of these are steps that brought you to where mm -hmm. you're at because yeah. it can be really overwhelming, I think, sometimes. And yeah. I've been sort of meditating on Jesus' words in John where he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Mm. In this world you will have trouble. Mm. <laughs> He's right. not like veiled Promise. about this. <laughs> yeah. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And mm. I've just been clinging to that because it is really easy to just become overwhelmed by the darkness. But if we keep yeah. our eyes on him, he gives us the strength we need for whatever's next, yeah. whatever that looks That's like. Good. That's so good. Good. I think that one of the things that you guys brought up, Jared and Beth, and even over on the adoption and foster care side of things, Josh and Marlene, is um, it's not just the, like, this is the issue, these are the needs, but we really know of a wonderful group of people who are positioned well, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, equipped, they, they have the indicators and markers to be solution providers. Mm -hmm. That's believers, that's the right. church. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And I'm uh, just seeing that, mm -hmm. I think, you know, hearing the need of, okay, if there were 10 calls last week for foster placement and um, you know what, what do we need to do? How many churches do we need to call? How many people in our church mm -hmm. do we need to rally and say, do you know anybody? Yeah. Um, you know, or, you know, even just on, on uh, getting ahead of that issue or helping people to heal 
uh, from their lives being impacted by yeah. the the grievous sin of mm-hmm. abortion. Like, man, yeah. that was me or that was my family mm-hmm. member. Um, you know, thinking about it, like one of the things just struck me is we're talking here, obviously, uh, love life, abundant life, olive crest, mm-hmm. um, and the church. And I just think if anybody watches the podcast and um, first thing you should do, like 100%, would you share this podcast Mm -hmm. with your pastor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Share this podcast with your pastor. Um, Share it with pastors that are connected to your life. Uh, I hope somebody shares this podcast to me. (laughs) (laughs) Because, you know, we need those reminders. We need, and I think sometimes it's like the courage that you need mm-hmm. to tackle the problem that's right in front of you mm-hmm. might come from somebody who's next to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good um, and sometimes yeah. even like, it's not, well, oh, you know, courage, sometimes you go, awareness is the first step. But yeah. I just think, you know, we, the church and the amount of believers, like we live in a crazy state. We're in Washington state. Not everybody watching the podcast is in Washington state, True. but we are. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things you go, oh man, that's terrible. Legislation. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. They're not, you know, all of this stuff, um, but you know, there's an amazing wealth of believers yeah, who love on. Jesus, yeah. who want to be a part of the solution. Right. Yeah. And um, you know, the greatest, the greatest resource in our state is represented by the church. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, you know, I'm I'm excited as as our church. You know, we don't we're not the answer, but I'm so grateful that we have friends like. Olive Crest, mm-hmm. that we have friends like Abundant Life and mm-hmm. Love Life, that we have mm-hmm. friends, you know, not only people within our congregation who are kind of that catalyst leading the way, pointing us to, to these friends, but that um, that we can be a part of, of helping to network and resource yeah. other churches, um, what we've learned along the way. I mean, it's an amazing thing when you just see, I, it's just striking me, yeah. the power of the church to be mm-hmm. yeah. uh, the answer yes. to the greatest issues, the yeah. greatest problems of our day. Yeah. Big C Amen. Church. And that's why we have yeah. to be able to, to partner together to honor one another, to mm-hmm. see past our differences and, yeah. you know, maybe yeah. some yeah. basic doctrinal stuff, you know, that, that's not the meat, yeah. but the, the yeah. extras, you know, right. to yeah. be able to bring bring us together to the table right. and talk yeah. about these things. You know, we've mm-hmm. gotten to to become friends with people from all across um, Protestantism, and it's been so refreshing. I'm sure. So refreshing, because where I haven't seen this um, in a lot of other ministries that we've worked with, but to really bring together the body of Christ centered around the person of Jesus and uh, mm. and what he's done for us and keeping that in the center. It, we can't do this alone. This right. is not something that yeah. any of us, any right. one church, yeah. any one uh, parent mm-hmm. church ministry can yeah. do on its right. own. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. Everybody but, doing their part. Yeah. yeah. yeah makes it happen just one mm-hmm. more question mm-hmm. i know there are people you know listening who the holy spirit is is stirring mm-hmm. and they're like that's it that's just like that nudge that i needed mm. to take the next step um or take the first step but what would that look like how how does someone who's interested in fostering or adopting yeah um how do they what's their first step yeah or next step? Well, if they go to olivecrest.org okay. there there's a lot of great uh opportunities in there they can also email me and i'll get them to the right person and that's josh dot or not dot please don't do dot josh <laughs> dash sperry s-p-e-r-r-y at olivecrest dot right. org uh one of the things that olivecrest does they they do these olivecrest 101s once a month that is just a a, a video call um mm-hmm. and it's not like the awkward timeshare where if you show up to this like you're you're, you're hooked, hooked. <laughs> um, but it's really a place to ask the hard questions mm-hmm. And our, we have an entire program team that does all of the licensing and casework. Wow. All the management's done through Olive Crest. And so it's a great place to even just, I don't know what, but I want to do something. It's right. a great place to start. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah. monthly one-on-one Zoom, Zoom class, you said? Yep. Or, that's awesome. Yep. That's great. That's a great resource. Yeah. And um, I'll add some of that information in the description so people can email you for real. <laughs> and if you're a part of Cedar Park... In November, we're having uh, Josh and team from Olive Crest come out and really just pitch this need to the entire congregation uh, with a follow-up, like right away, like a kind of that one-on-one look Mm -hmm. right away. But uh, November twelfth, and again, that's why it's important. Maybe you're part of another church. uh, Have your pastor connect with Josh. Josh's job is to connect with pastors. Mm -hmm. He is a pastor. He loves pastors (laughs) and wants to help bring that answer to it. So, I mean, if our churches did that, that's an amazing thing. Wow. Yes. Well, this has been awesome, and mm-hmm. I felt the Holy Spirit. I have mm. definitely um, heard that call, yeah. and I know that you know 
that the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to people. So thank mm. you for your time, being willing mm. to share a little bit of your story. And um, Jay, would you mind closing us up in a word of prayer? Yeah. And then we'll just sign off. Awesome. Mm. Okay. Well, Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful uh, to be surrounded with wonderful friends. Uh, Father, and it's just striking me that the very thing that's bringing us together today, where your Holy Spirit is speaking and talking to people, are really dark things. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I'm thankful even that you use dark things like abortion, dark mm -hmm. things like the trauma that children experience and the brokenness in individuals and families uh, to bring the hope of the gospel yeah into our lives. And so, mm -hmm. Lord, we just pray that we would steward well the moments. Lord, we pray blessing yeah. over these amazing families and ministries that are represented yeah. around this table today. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, for, for Olive Crest and the wonderful efforts and mm -hmm. strength and, and hope that they're sowing into the lives of foster and adoptive mm -hmm. families and bringing uh, by connecting them with uh, foster and adoptive children. Lord, mm -hmm. we pray blessing and flourishing yeah. for open doors mm -hmm. uh, into connecting the faith community to mm -hmm. this great need. Lord, we thank you for mm -hmm. abundant life and the ecosystem yes. of providing answers to the questions that yes, women Lord. face that often lead them uh, to making poor decisions. Lord, that we would be a part of that uh, understanding. Lord, I pray blessing over Beth and her yes. team. Yes. Uh, Lord. Lord, we thank yes. you uh, for love life yes. and yes. this this heartbeat that is not just here in our state, but it is nationally and it is around the world that you would continue to sow uh, great uh, seeds of faith and favor mm -hmm. into love life, mm -hmm. that there would be, as Jared said, there are 25 churches in our state who have now decided to become places of refuge, Thank Lord, you, that you would even uh, through conversation and this season, Lord, just open up the hearts of pastors and yes. congregations, yes, Lord. Uh, Lord, that that number would Giving continue to th thrive yeah. and grow and flourish mm. so that every church uh, would be involved uh, in bringing an answer to this solution. Mm -hmm. Lord, yeah. thank you that you use uh, this conversation to stir all of our hearts towards your purposes mm -hmm. to be the answer, the light in the darkness. The yes. light shines in the darkness, but oh, the Jesus. darkness has not overcome it. God, mm -hmm. we thank you that that mm -hmm. is our calling, that's our reality. We pray these wonderful things in the name of our Savior, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Amen. 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 And I want to say Amen. thank you to all of our lifers that have joined in and listened to this conversation. Again, remember what Pastor Jay said, share it and with anybody that you can think of that would benefit from this conversation and we will see you next time. This is my soul.